the human enterprise is in potentially disastrous overshoot, exploiting the ecosphere beyond ecosystems regenerative capacity. This is not the time and place for dreams. This is the time to wake up. This is a moment in history where we need to be wide awake. Those are the words of an ecological economist, William Rees, and of a child activist, Greta Thunberg. 20 years ago, when the 9-11 Commission report was published, the authors cited, first of all, our failure of imagination. That single line haunts me, because in light of the data Rees provides in his science-based article about ecological economics, we as a species and ecosystem are moving beyond regenerative capacity. And in the light of Greta Thunberg's statement to be wide awake, I have to ask, what is my purpose? What can artists contribute? We can't save the world by playing by the rules, because the rules have to be changed. Everything needs to change and it has to start today. Greta Thunberg. The world's best hope to avoid collapse may be an unavoidable and ultimately staggering ecological disaster to strike soon at the heart of the developed world. In this project, a group of poets and artists propose a small act of resistance to use our words, mind, metal, imaginations to envision what we would all prefer to deny, a future where we are no longer able to regenerate. Everything is held together with stories. That is all that is holding us together, stories and compassion. Barry Lopez. The economic paradigms that run our lives are made up stories, complex social constructs conceived in language and massaged into accepted theory. The world is in thrall to a mythic construct of perpetual material growth. Once upon a time, once upon a time. How do we change the story? What would the new story be about? How about once upon a pandemic? That's real. Okay, well, think about our world. Like our world without something. Like something that we love. Like butterflies? Oh yeah, okay, butterflies. So the question we ask the poets, what creature, now perhaps merely threatened, but likely gone within a few years, what lost creature would break your heart to live without? We invited them to use their imaginations. Let's start with those butterflies. The last monarch. Suddenly, there was a summer without monarchs. I'd seen monarchs clustered in small trees on the north shores of large lakes, waiting for a night breeze to carry them across. So many butterflies on one tree that it bent almost to the ground. And then, a summer without monarchs. And I'd walked one September beside another lake littered with the broken orange wings of monarchs caught in storms trying to cross. And just the October before, I'd seen one monarch lonely on a baseball field, flying south. But still, suddenly, one summer without monarchs. And then, the fall.
So the monarchs are gone? Well, we have a wing, see? What about snails? The, in the old books there were snails. I saw a picture once, the last of the Hawaiian tree snails. His name was Lonesome George. He died on New Year's Day 2019. Scientists had been looking for a mate for him for 10 years. They never found one. Well then what good is science? They might bring him back. They took part of his foot. His foot? For science, I gave up a bit of my foot. It's frozen now, in case one day I can be cloned. It's nice there were so many binocular-bearing humans in the rainforest, scouting the trees for another of me. But I used to wonder why I wasn't allowed to look myself. In a lab I was bred, my dinners brought to me snipped and still, when what I wanted was the feel of living bark under the foot they took a piece of for science. What about frogs? I found a frog once. It was the color of a ghost. Are there still frogs? I'm little, but I remember when it rained, they would sing. Are there still some singing somewhere? Ghost frogs. If there were ever a day for frogs, this is it. Lake's edge in spring, the place where logs lie, just where I left them last year, and the ghosts of the multitudinous frogs of my youth are croaking from the unknown, from the transformations, from the alien slime with their splay feet and pop eyes, and whose singing is indistinguishable from my mourning that may be coming through the semi-permeable nature of their skin. Once I shot frogs with my granddaddy's BB gun and we fried up the legs. Frogs are carnivores too. Life is mutual eating, but sometimes I feel myself eating until there is nothing left but howling desert, which I spell desert. And when I have finished that, and my kayak is stranded in the middle of nothing, a few small peepers, oh please, start up to show me I cannot devour everything. Okay, no fogs. What about bugs? What about condors? They're huge. Or oh, trumpeter swans. What's the most beautiful bird in the world? One who would match the sky. But what if we've never seen a blue sky? That's a problem. Imagine to be the blue of sky and fly. the indigo bunting. I want a world where every year there are more indigo buntings. More of us, our flicker of dusk, chip of blue against blue, that deepening splash against sky. When there are many, both of us grow elegantly more blue, sky and bird. To imagine a world without our blue flight slashing dusk is to imagine a world without the necessary variations of wonder. Humans 
hold funerals for their beloveds, but not for us. Not for the lost indigos, not for the sky within sky that will no longer sing. It is your loss too. When the last of we buntings no longer rise, what feathered hope dies in you? When the sky that we are fades away at last, neither sky nor blue will be true. It costs a lot now. Only rich people have it. Weren't there ponds once also? If there were ponds, there was water. But is it free and clean? A door, a door, the word pond. It has soft sides. It's still, like heart, closes, like time. It doesn't contain flood, can't be broken with a sigh. A pond would fit inside my palm if palms could hold like eyes. So if the butterflies are gone, and the birds, and the snails, and the frogs, and the ponds I live in. What about the mammals? Yeah, mammals. Like cats and dogs and other stuff. Like us? Do we survive? Only some. But without the others, without the creatures, like otters, Once, the decaying apple trees in the near orchard bent and knuckled down toward the seeding tall grass of summer. The great stalks surging upward into the barked increasing elbows as blown hair against the puckered mouths of burls. Sometimes, back then, our minds could settle into the quiet, receptive as a pond surface still and open to the sky. In such a moment, they came as a lucid dream, running into our gaze, breaching the waves of grass, brown curved backs of shining fur rising and falling. He knew they were river otters, the last three. How, I asked. Pictures, a film clip long ago, he said. We were struck by the seeming joy of their movement, rippling bodies, stitching air to light, land to water, wildness to mind. Then they were gone. We didn't try to follow them into their burrows. The tunnels deep in the banks arched over the stream, a scarf of fresh water curved as an arm around the orchard, or into the spill of stream water itself, pouring lakeward. I regret this. Who knows what took them? Coyotes, microcystin toxin, traps set with the hope of pelts. They are long gone now, and the hard surfaces, glass, metal, mirror, that compel our busy, restless gazes, stare back empty. 
No glisten of living fur, bright eyes, prints of webbed feet between the blades. To change the way we exist, we have to change the story we believe, that resources, growth, profit are endless. Humanity is now standing at a crossroads. We must now decide which path we want to take. Greta Thunberg. What if we kept hope? About what? About the debris. What's left? What if we use it to make something? To make amends. What's amends? It's the way to go on. To go on? We don't yet know how it ends, but we're looking at possibilities. We're imagining how to transform the holy debris. We cannot, of course, save the world because we do not have authority over its parts. We can serve the world, though. That is everyone's calling, to lead a life that helps. Barry Lopez. And that's where you come in. We hope this work, these poems, this art, provoked by a small degree the possibility of a new narrative. And you're in the conversation. Let us not fail the power of imagination ever. <laughs>